So we're back to this uh, series on a biblical theology of work, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about this the last few weeks, and and uh, talking with some of you. Some of you have sent in questions and comments and so forth. I appreciate that. If I haven't answered your question yet, that's because I'm hoping to answer it as the series develops. If at the end of it all I still haven't answered your question, then uh, then uh, write me back and say, hey, remember that question I sent you? You never answered it. And uh, then I'll sit down and give you a personal uh, answer. But I type with two fingers. So uh, if, you get a, if you get anything typed from me, frame it. <laughs> and um, anyway... You know, I've been thinking, as I said, about the series and actually was talking with my wife about it a little bit this morning, and, and we were commenting, this is, this is really something kind of different for us here at Foothill. Normally, we work through a book of the Scriptures, and we do it in uh, really kind of excruciating detail. We're, uh, we're working our way through Matthew's Gospel, if you haven't forgotten that, and uh, we finished through chapter 9, and I think it took us about two years to get through the first uh, nine chapters. And uh, we will, after Easter, get back to Matthew's Gospel, picking it up in chapter 10. So this is a very different kind of uh, series, and this series is also not, we're not spending a lot of time, you know, like pulling verses apart. You've probably noticed that. Furthermore, you've, you've probably noticed that, that um, the application uh, on Sunday morning is maybe not as, as uh, detailed as you might like. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is because basically what we're doing is uh, training you how to think. This is, you might, uh, you might say, Christian worldview training. This is taking some, some theological truths that are clearly uh, rooted in Scripture, either by explicit statement or by necessary implication, and they're kind of bringing them out and we're building them together, and, um, and I'm walking you through it. But I'm in the process, I'm training you how to think. And what I, what I need you to do is to work out the details of how that applies in your own particular circumstances. Because there is such a diversity of a crowd here to try to apply things in a, in a very detailed fashion, we would get lost. There are a whole many, many books written on the whole topic of the Christian at work. So this morning, it's, this, it's the same basic idea. There's uh, some framework we're going to lay down here, and uh, I'll give you some suggested applications, but I'm calling on you to think about what you're hearing, uh, search the Scriptures yourself, see if these things aren't true, and then work it out in your own particular circumstances. And I want to start by telling you uh, just an abbreviated story about a, about a man who did just that, a man who worked these things out for himself and what a profound impact it had upon him and how he approached work, and by virtue of that, what a profound impact it's had on every one of us sitting here today. I want to talk to you for just a minute about a man by the name of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was born sometime around 1864. There's some discrepancy about his exact exact date of birth. He was born of slave parents in the Civil War South. He was orphaned at a very, very young age. Well, just a baby, really. According to his own testimony, he says he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when he was about 10 years old. God had granted this man a very keen intellect and it was recognized by others and so really in in sort of an unprecedented way occurrence for a black man of his day, he attended Iowa State College and earned a degree in agriculture. For decades, the South had relied upon cotton as its cash crop. They grew cotton and they would sell and export cotton and it produced uh, their, the income to fuel that economy. Now, the problem with planting cotton year after year after year is that it, over time it depletes the soil. And so the soil in, in the post-Civil War South had become seriously depleted, and it needed to be rejuvenated. Now, the farmers knew that planting other kinds of crops would rejuvenate the soil. They knew for example, that the planting of peanuts and sweet potatoes 
would rejuvenate the soil and enable it. If you would rotate the crops, you could, you could do this on an alternating basis and you could continue to plant cotton in the same fields, just not year after year. The problem was that there was no market for the produce of sweet potatoes and peanuts. You couldn't sell them. And because you couldn't sell them, the banks would not lend the farmers any money in order to plant their fields with peanuts and sweet potatoes. And so the only choice they had was to continue to plant cotton and to continue to deplete the soil. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why they wanted, prior to the Civil War, to continue to expand westward to find new rich fields for cotton. Well, in 1896, Booker T. Washington, who was the president of Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, hired Dr. Carver to come to the school and to teach the poor black students there at the school. And over the next 40 plus years, as, as Dr. Carver taught there at the school, and he had a laboratory where he conducted experiments and resor- uh, research upon peanuts and sweet potatoes. And in the process of that, and out of that laboratory, he developed over 300 uses for the peanut and 118 uses for the sweet potato. He single-handedly created the markets for peanuts and sweet potatoes. Now, just so you understand the significance of this, here are some of the uses of peanuts. They are used in adhesives, axle grease, bleach, buttermilk, chili sauce, fuel briquettes, printer's ink, instant coffee, linoleum, mayonnaise, meat tenderizer, metal polish, paper, plastic, pavement, shaving cream, shoe polish, synthetic rubber, talcum powder, and wood stain from peanuts, from peanuts. What enabled this man to really do something so amazing? Well, when asked about that, he, he said, I, I locked myself in my laboratory and I, and I took a handful of peanuts and I prayed to God and, and, I, and I basically asked the Creator to help me to see and understand the potential that was latent in the peanut, that which he had created. And God answered his prayer in an amazing way. And the man was incredibly productive. For the past two weeks, as part of our series here, we have been talking about the effects of the fall of Adam upon work, right? It's been kind of a downer a little bit. We, uh, we saw two weeks ago that Adam's fall brought judgment upon the creation itself, and that not work as the entity created by God as, is cursed, but the 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 creation has been placed under a curse because of Adam's fall, and thus work is exceedingly difficult and frustrating and does not yield all that it could yield. Last week, we saw the effect of sin upon the worker, and that was uh, fun as well. Because what we learned there is when Adam fell, it rendered him and his offspring sinners by nature and choice. And the effect of that sin upon the worker, last week we looked at primarily the issue of laziness and how the sin of laziness impacts all of us to one degree or another. Well, I'd like to turn this morning to a little bit happier topic, if I could. And so I want to turn this morning with you to the redemption of work. We're turning the corner, and we are turning now to the redemption of work. The redemption of work. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. A very, very significant statement. A very significant statement. Because it, it speaks about the radical transformation that occurs in each and every one when they place their 
faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we repent and believe on Christ, we are truly changed, truly changed. And we are set upon a new path and a new trajectory of life. And the transformation that occurs there has the potential to change everything about us. Everything. And that includes how we work. How we work. The transformation in Christ also has implications for the way as Christians that we work. One writer in in commenting on this, he, he writes the following, and I quote, The gospel does not wrap us with a thin religious or ethical veneer. That is, that it's not just a a surface, it's not just a paint job, but goes to the very core of our sinful minds and hearts. When we embrace the good news of the gospel, we are transformed from the inside out. That is so important to understand. The transformation that occurs in Christ affects every single fiber of our being and has the potential to change the way we do everything, including work. Now, when we, when we begin to try to think about this, I think that perhaps an analogy would be helpful. An analogy would be helpful. And that is the analogy that I'd like to use is that of a Christian marriage. A Christian marriage. When a man and a woman come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and then wed, they have now the potential to begin to recapture some of what was lost in Adam's fall. And in fact, the Apostle Paul speaks in those kinds of terms in Ephesians chapter 5, when beginning in verse 22 through verse 31, where he speaks to the, to the husband and to the wife, and, and you know the passage well. He says to the husband that, that he, is to, he is to love his wife. And he is, and he is to lead her with a, with a loving leadership. And he speaks to the wife and, and he says you are, to, you are to submit to your husband and you are to respect your husband and you are, to, you are to follow his God-given leadership. The very thing that was attacked by Satan in the fall was, was Adam's leadership of Eve and Eve's submission to Adam. And, and Paul says, hey, listen. In Christ, not perfectly, to be sure, but there is, the, there is the potential there to begin to recapture some of what was lost. And the same is true for work. The same is true for work. As a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can begin to recapture some of what was lost with regard to work. Now, can we change the creation? Can we lift the curse? Of course not. Of course not. But we can begin to live differently. Differently. Again, a quote for you. Christ's death does not change work, but changes the worker. Christ's death does not change work, but it changes the worker. It changes me. It changes you. So here we go. You ready? Let's talk about it a little bit. This morning, I've got four reasons for you. Four reasons why being a Christian changes the way we work. Four reasons why being a Christian changes the way we work so that we will think and do rightly in the workplace. We will begin to think rightly and thus we will begin to do rightly in the workplace. We will begin to express our Christianity in the workplace. So here we go. Are you ready? Number one reason. We now have a new understanding of our work. We now have a new understanding understanding of our work. Let me develop it for you this way. We understand that work is worship. We now understand that work is worship. Let me turn you to Ephesians chapter 2 as I quickly sketch this out for you. Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 8. Ephesians 2 beginning in verse 8. Paul writes there, for by grace you have been saved through faith And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Paul says we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. 
without reference to works. God does not in any way look to or depend upon anything that we might do. It is only salvation by His grace alone through faith alone. However, those who are redeemed in Christ have been redeemed for a purpose, Paul says. And the purpose is to express the, the new commitments to Christ in the form of good works. Good works. And Paul doesn't leave us guessing as to what are those good works. It's not just a, like a nebulous thing. Oh yeah, I'm saved to do good works, but what are they? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's probably serving in the nursery at church or something. You know? No. Paul, Paul doesn't leave us guessing. He actually lays out for us in the balance of, of the epistle what are the, the good works that we have been saved for. And, it, and we pick it up in, in chapter 4 and verse 1. So I want to I turn you there. Just turn over a page or so to, to chapter 4 and verse 1. And this is the, this is the transition point in the epistle, of course. Verses, or chapters 1 through 3, Paul is, is hammering away at some very uh, deep uh, theology. But beginning in chapter 4, he begins to, to talk through the application of that theology. And he begins in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. The calling is what is laid out in chapters 1 through 3. So Paul says now that I want you to to walk here in a a worthy manner. What does it mean to worthy? The idea, we've talked about this before, is to to bring things into balance, to bring up the other side of the scale, to begin to to live in light of who you now are in Christ so that your, your deeds, your actions, your life reflects your new faith in Christ. So you've got to live it out. And chapters 4 through 6 is an amplification of what it means to, to live it out. And Paul teases that out for us. And as we are living it out, what we are really doing is the good works, according to chapter 2, verse 10, that have been prepared for us to walk in beforehand. So what does that mean? Well, simply put, beginning in verse 2 of chapter 4, running all the way through verse 16, the implication here of the worthy walk of the good works are as it relates to the church. As it relates to the church. And Paul talks here about a unity in diversity within the church. Beginning in verse 17 and running all the way through chapter 5 and verse 21, he speaks there about our personal life. Good works as it relates to our personal life. And and the basic idea is holiness of body and mind. A holiness of body and mind. Then in chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, running through chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul talks about good works or the, the implications of the gospel for our lives with regard to family. And specifically, he speaks about the husband wife relationship and he speaks about the parent child relationship. So it's within the family. Then beginning in verse 5 of chapter 6 and running through verse 9, he speaks about it with regard to work. With regard to work. And in particular there, it's slaves and masters. And then he finishes it off speaking about community and beginning in chapter 6, verse 10, all the way through verse 17. And he speaks there about living in a hostile world as a community of believers. This is all the implications of what it means to walk worthy, to bring your life in alignment with who you now are, to begin to do the good works that have been predestined for you to do from the beginning of time as a follower of Christ. What this means, beloved, is is that how and why we work changes as a result of our conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation changes something. It changes something. Our work now becomes a good work, part of what has been predestined for us and a means by which we express worship to our Creator. Now, we need to understand something else. We need to understand that work is godlike. Work is godlike. And for that, I want to turn you over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Work is godlike. Paul is speaking here in Colossians chapter 1 about Christ, the cosmic Christ. 
And he says in verse 17 that he, that is Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In other words, that that Jesus sustains, Jesus upholds, Jesus manages, Jesus orders, Jesus arranges, Jesus forms, Jesus fills, Jesus decorates, Jesus beautifies the creation. He is actively involved in all aspects of the creation at all times. He is sustaining all things by the power of his word. And we, as followers of Christ, are to to imitate Christ. And there is a, a sense in which we can imitate Christ here in that we can participate in a, in a small way in these godlike activities. It is, it is really nothing more than getting back to the, to the Garden of Eden and to Genesis chapter 1 and to the dominion mandate that was given there to those first human beings. And we can capture a piece of this in Christ. And what that means is, is that we can, we can apply ourselves to our work and we can express in our work our God-given talents and abilities. And when we do this, we are emulating Christ. We're acting in accordance with a way that is pleasing to God. It is, it is the way God has made us to be. And we begin to recover a little bit of what it means to be made in the image of God. And when we do that, when you do that in your work, God is pleased with you. And when God is pleased with you, you can sense and you can feel the pleasure of God. Now you get a glimpse of this in a a quotation that is probably, you know, old hat to all of you. But it comes from from a man by the name of Eric Liddell, who in 1924 was an Olympic runner and won the gold medal in the men's 400-meter race. There was a movie made about it, Chariots of Fire, and, and it was a well-done film. And in there, there's a, there's a quote by Eric Liddell that I, and I, it's well worth remembering. He says, and I quote, I believe God made me for a purpose, but He also made me fast. And when I run, I feel His pleasure. I feel His pleasure. When basically what Liddell is saying is, is when I do what I was made to do, when I operate in according with the manufacturer's intentions and instructions, I feel his pleasure. I feel his pleasure. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever felt the pleasure of God? Have you ever, have you ever sensed that, that God is, is just really pleased with me and what I am doing? at this time. Because it's not only possible, beloved, but it's something that we should be striving after. Striving after. Now, Eric Liddell, he he was more than just an an Olympic runner after the 1924 Games. He headed off to China as a missionary where he served for 20 years. Ended up dying in a Japanese prison camp in 19... Uh, 45, I believe it was, uh, just five months before the end of World War II. But I think George Washington Carver also understood this basic idea. As he was alone in his laboratory contemplating the peanut, he could sense the pleasure of God. And it, and it fueled him. It, it drove him to begin to, to take this thing apart. And, and to examine it, I, you know, hey, I eat peanuts at the ballpark, right? You pop the shells and in goes the mouth, you throw the peanut shells on the floor. He looks at every component and he says, God put this together this way for a reason. And, there, and there's a lot here and I, and I just need to, to, in reliance of God, draw out what he has already put in. And as it began to yield itself to him, he could sense the pleasure of God. Sense the pleasure of God. Part of what it means to be a Christian at work is, is that it changes, it changes the way we work. Secondly, we have a new boss at work. 
We now have a new boss at work. There's another reason why being a Christian changes the way you work. You, you got a new boss. You got a new boss. Now, the New Testament doesn't directly address the issue of modern-day employers and employees. The, the situation in which the, uh, we find ourselves is a more recent phenomenon. The rise of a free middle class is, uh, post-dates the, the New Testament in the history of the world. And so the New Testament uh, is written in a time in which slavery is very much the economic system of the Roman Empire. There's no question about it. In fact, most scholars say that in those days, up to a half of the Roman Empire were slaves. The empire was that dependent upon slave labor. And these slaves could be found in all kinds of professions, all kinds of professions. Because the way a person became a slave, generally speaking, in the Roman Empire was one of three. It would have been either you were born to slave parents or through financial loss, you either sold yourself or you were taken into slavery until the financial loss could be repaid. Or finally, it could be by military conquest. That is, if you were part of, a, of a, a particular geographical area that was conquered, you would be enslaved. What that means is that all kinds of what we would today think of as professional people were slaves. And so the empire relied upon slaves to do many things, including working in the fields of medicine and education and all kinds of things. But they were slaves. They were generally what we would call household slaves. Household slaves. And, and when the New Testament speaks of slavery, primarily that's what it's speaking about is what we would know as household slaves. They were attached to a particular household. Now, they were considered property. However, they, they generally had the opportunity of upward social mobility. What that means is that they could, they could earn some money on the side, and, and they could save money that they earned on the side, and they could eventually uh, redeem themselves. They could buy their, themselves back out of their own slavery. It was a very weird kind of system in that sense because at the same time, the slave owner, the master, had incredible authority over them and could up to and including executing them. So it was a, it was a, it was a very uh, unique uh, sort of arrangement. But when the New Testament... Uh, it writes about Christianity and slavery. It's not specifically addressing the day-to-day -day issues that, that you and I face. Okay, You, you might have a, a difficult boss, but he is not your slave master. Okay, But that doesn't mean that there's nothing we can learn. There are principles that we can draw. There are implications that we can draw based on Paul's instructions to the, the, the slave and master's of the world of the first century, and those principles are applicable to us today, and so that's what I want to do. So we now have a new boss, we now have a new boss, and that is that we work for Christ and not for men. You got a new boss. I don't know if you knew that or not. Hallelujah. Okay, you got a new boss. If, if Friday, when you came home from work, you were thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, how am I ever going to go back Monday? You don't know what it is like. Hey, good news. When you go back Monday, you got a new boss. You got a new boss. Chapter 3 of Colossians, beginning in verse 22. Slaves, slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality." So Paul, speaking here to, to the slave class, and I'm going to say that by implication of instruct, the instruction here, he is speaking to those of us who find ourselves in the position of employee. He's speaking to the employees here. And what he is saying to them in verse 
22 is that he is stressing a constant and a daily obedience to the work that you've been given to do. And it is not dependent on whether you like to do the work or don't like to do the work. You don't see that caveat in there. It doesn't matter whether the work is pleasing or unpleasant. It is still the same in all things. He says, in all things, not just the part of your work that you enjoy, but the part of your work that you don't enjoy. In all things, you are to be in daily obedience to those who are in authority over you. Now, when Paul says in all things, there's an obvious exception, and that would be things in which uh, by doing them you would be in conflict with God's law. We'll just set that aside for now. Now, the manner, he says, verse 22, is very interesting. The manner in which, in which you are to be obedient here in all things is, to, is he states it in both a negative and a positive way. You see it? He says, first, negatively, verse 22, not with external service, literally eye service. You're not to do your work with eye service. Talk about that in a second. Positively, you are to do your work with a sincerity of heart with a sincerity of heart. And, and when you put those two together, what it says is, is that as an employee, we are to be working in such a way uh, that is pleasing to Christ without regard to whether the boss is watching or not. Not with eye service, meaning don't work hard when the boss is around, and then when the boss is not around, you have a different speed, kind of a two-speed transmission, right? We've got, the, we've got the boss's speed and we've got the regular speed. Now, you all know what I'm talking about because you've all either observed it or likely been guilty of it to one degree or another. And that's true, I think, of all of us. And that goes back to our laziness uh, discussion of a week ago. So we are not to work in a way that meets the minimum standard. But instead, we're, we're to work in such a way that the inner attitude and the outward performance of our conduct are compatible. Why? Paul, why? Why, why? why do I have to work like that? Well, the answer is because you are a Christian slave. That is that you are a slave of Jesus Christ. That, that despite your outward circumstances, when you work, you're not really working for the man. You're working for your master, Christ. He is your true master, verse 23. Whatever you do, you do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. You're working for the Lord. Jesus is your true master. And as Paul lays out here in verses 24 and and 25, Jesus doesn't, doesn't tally the payroll records at the end of every day. But according to verse 24, there is a reward coming for those who work well and work hard. There is a reward, and it will come when Christ gives out His rewards at the Bema seat. And there is also the the threat here, verse 25, of a consequence, a consequence that comes upon those who disrespect Christ by their work. Now, Paul's addressing slaves, I I, I agree. And slaves are the lowest members of society. Think with me on this. The slaves were the lowest members of society. They they were often involved in in daily menial tasks. Some of them are actually kind of disgusting, disgusting things. And yet Paul says to them, you are not working for God. A human master, you are working for your true master, Christ, and and thus how you work reflects what you believe about Jesus Christ. And there is great reward in a work ethic that matches your theology. So when Paul says, you know, you're serving Christ by your work, that if he can say that to a slave, then by implication he can say that to me and he can say that to you, right? You're also serving Christ by your work. So how are you going to serve Him? What does it mean? A little, in, a little bit of application here. What does it mean to serve Christ rather than man? What does it look like? Well, here's some suggestions. I'll just sketch them out for you fast. Number one, 
We need to have a thankful and helpful, and helpful attitude at work. We need to have a thankful and helpful attitude for work. We need to be thankful for our job, not because we get money. Oh, you thankful for your job? I'm thankful for my job. You know, I hate it, but I get paid. That is not a Christian attitude. We need to be thankful and grateful for work, for the opportunity to work, because the opportunity to work is the opportunity to worship and to begin in, in a small way to, to, to recapture some of what it means to be human, to be human. There are people who want to work and can't work. We need to be thankful that we do have the ability to work. And so we need to be thankful for work in general. We need to be thankful for our job in particular. We need to be thankful for our coworkers. We need to be thankful for our supervisors. You know what, that can, just that alone can completely change the way you see your work. If you see it with a thankfulness of your heart. Second, what does it mean to serve Christ rather than man at work? It means we work hard and we work with diligence. Work hard, work with diligence. Why? Because Jesus is always watching. If you, you, know, if you have to do it because the boss is watching, remember this, Jesus is always watching. He is with you no matter where you are and no matter what you do. Now, ideally, we don't do it just because the boss is watching, right? We do it out of an intrinsic motivation, a love for Christ, and so forth. But we should work hard, work with diligence. That's what it means. To serve Christ rather than man. Third, it means to to be honest in our dealings. It means to be honest in our business dealings, our work dealings. Such as honesty in our time cards. We need to be honest in our time cards. It means we need to punch in and punch out according to an honest biblical ethic. And I don't care what everybody else is doing. It means we need to be honest in our price quotes. We're in a position where we're, we're quoting prices to people. We need to be honest about that. We need not to quote one price, to tease them in the door, and then pull the bait and switch, right? And give them the other price. We need to be honest about such things. We need to be honest about guarantees and refunds. If something's guaranteed, then it's guaranteed. If there's a refund available, then there's a refund available. And we shouldn't be looking to weasel out of such things. We need to be truthful in our advertising. Isn't it interesting that we have to have laws that govern all this stuff? Don't you find that interesting? That's because we we live in a a society uh, in which the the vast majority of the society doesn't know Christ. So we have to have external law in order to get them to do things that the Christian can and should do out of mere intrinsic motivation for the love of Christ and the Spirit of God that resides within us, who changes our minds and empowers us to do what's right. So we don't need truth in advertising laws if we're Christians. We need to have truthful advertising. Simple. Simple. We need to be truthful in our hiring and firing practices. There are times when you have to discharge an employee for for certain things. We need to be honest about that. We We need to be honest with them as to why they are being let go. And when we hire them, we need to be honest about why we're hiring them. These are just sort of simple things. They ought to be intuitive. Here's another one. To work for Christ rather than man means to do our best producing a quality product at a fair price. We need to produce a quality product at a fair price. What does that mean? That means no caveat emptor. What is that? It's just a Latin expression that means let the buyer beware, right? I produce junk. It's up to you to figure that out. That's many people's business ethic. It should not be a Christian business ethic. It doesn't comport with working for Christ. Jesus doesn't produce junk. Jesus, and, and, and emulating Christ, we shouldn't produce junk either. So we need to produce a quality product, and we need to sell it at a fair price. What do I mean by that? No price gouging. No price gouging. A little autobiographical detail for you here. I have been guilty in the past of price gouging. Years and years ago, more than decades now, I worked for a major bank, and as part of that process, um, I had the ability to set certain fee schedules. And uh, my whole compensation package was based upon 
the money, part of it, the money that I generated in, by charging fees. And so there have been occasions in the past, I regret it now, in which I used the leverage that I had in a business situation to charge a customer more than the going rate because I had no choice but to pay it. That's not Christian. It's just not Christian. I shouldn't have done it. It was wrong. It was sin. We need to make a quality product. We need to charge a fair price. It doesn't matter if you're the only game in town. You can't charge whatever you want. I don't know what the number is, five, something like that. Working for Christ rather than man, we need to, we need to take a stand for righteousness in the workplace. We need to take a stand for righteousness in the workplace. What does that mean? It means among many, many things, we're not to be participating in those things that happen in the workplace that bring shame on the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4, something simple. He basically says, listen, there should be no coarse jesting, no, no silly talk, no crude humor. It shouldn't even be named among the followers of Christ. So, you know what, as a Christian, what does that mean? That means that when the, when the people gather, and it's, it used to be only guys, I think, but now it's men and women, and they gather around the coffee pot and they start telling, you know, dirty jokes and stuff, it means you've got to walk away. It means you've got to walk away. You've got to stand for righteousness. You need to refuse to bend the rules. Everybody does it. No. Followers of Christ don't do that. It may cost you your job. It's possible. But you need to stand for righteousness. Third reason. Third reason. We now have a new orientation towards our work. A new orientation, right? We have a new understanding. We have a new boss. Now we have a new orientation. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if you are in a position, and this is not true of everyone here, but there are some of you it's very true of. If you are in a position of management or, or supervisory responsibility, at your work, then you are your brother's keeper. You are your brother's keeper, at least at some level. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, grant your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. You too have a master in heaven. I mean, the law in the, New, in the time of the New Testament said that the master could be cruel and could be unreasonable with his slaves, and really there's nothing that anybody could do about it. But Paul says, no, not a Christian master can't do that. The Christian master is not driven by what is legal. The Christian master is driven by what is right. And by implication, that means that the, the Christian boss is not driven by what is legal, the Christian supervisor is not driven by what does the policy manual say. The Christian boss, the Christian supervisor, the Christian business owner is driven by what is right, what is just and what is fair. What is just and what is fair. Simply put, it's this. Fair pay and just working conditions. Fair pay and just working conditions is the responsibility of those who name the name of Christ and are in a position where they have authority over other workers. You need to pay somebody something. You need to pay them fairly. And you need to provide a, a working environment that is, that is reasonable, that is fair, that is just. Listen, God is generous. He has been generous with you. Isn't that true? God has lavished His grace upon you. He has poured out His riches in Christ upon you. If you are made in the image of God and renewed in Christ, then, then generosity needs to motivate us too. It just has to be. We need to be generous people because God has been generous with us. Listen, Christians, we, we, we don't need the government to tell us what a fair wage is. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be relying on such things. We shouldn't be providing working conditions. You know, what can I get away with? What, is a, what does the EPA require or whatever? We should be doing what is right. Doing what is right. But yeah, but pastor, if I do what is right, you know, it's going to affect my profits. Yep, probably will. Probably will. So what? So what? Is your citizenship here or there, right? 
here or there. Since when is the accumulation of profit the final motive and, and measure of what it means to be successful in a business world? This is tough stuff. I mean, labor unions uh, arose in the, in the early, in the, in the uh, uh, late in the, in the 19th century and early into the 20th century, and they arose because of greedy employers who made life of the working person ridiculous. They treated them in, in subhuman ways. And so the whole organized labor movement arose in order to, to extract by the power of leverage and, and strike and all of that, that which Christians should have willingly given. Willingly given. Listen, if you're a Christian business owner, I'm just going to challenge you. You ought to provide pay and working conditions at such a level that, that if someone were to come in there and say, hey, let's organize a union here, they'd look at them and say, what, are you crazy? so that I can get a reduction in pay in a, in a more difficult working environment? It's a challenge. I leave it to you to think it through. Fourth reason. Fourth reason, being a Christian should change the way you work. We now have a new stamina for our work. A new stamina. Check this out. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, let's say you came to faith, you know, today, may God be praised. Let's say you come to faith today, and you go to work tomorrow. Nothing's going to change at work. Do you know that? You realize that? You're going to get work tomorrow, and it's going to be the same difficult environment that you left on Friday. Your boss is not going to treat you any better. Your coworkers are not going to treat you better. Your competitors are not going to, to treat you any better. The difficulties and challenges you face there are not going to go away. Nothing changes but you. But you. And it might actually get worse for you. Okay? Hey, good news, right? Gospel is good news, man. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ, right? Because... You need to die to yourself and follow Him. Life's going to get harder and, and likely will get harder. You may now find yourself working for a boss that doesn't appreciate your Christianity. The unreasonable boss. So what happens if you're working for the unbelieving, unreasonable boss? Well, it kind of goes like this. You've got, you got to have stamina, and you have stamina because you're able to see the good while working for the unreasonable boss. What changes is your perspective. Now, I know some of you are working for unreasonable bosses. We've, we've talked about this. And you say, oh, you've told me about it, and I think, wow, you got it hard. It's a hard place. Paul says in Romans 8, 28, we know God causes most things to work together for good. All right? Is that what that says? God causes all things, all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. All things include your work and your boss and your supervisor. All things. Okay, so let's say you are working for the unreasonable boss. Well, what do you do? Well, here's how it goes. You find yourself working for the unreasonable boss. I think the first thing you need to do is look in the mirror. You didn't expect me to say that, did you? First thing you need to do is you need to look in the mirror. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Before you go to take the speck out of your boss's eye, make sure that you're not clubbing him in the side of the head with a log hanging out of your own eye. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, you need to ask yourself, and, and you need to bring along a counselor or two that are wise and honest and um, forthright who will help you to evaluate the fact that you might be lazy. And the reason you have what appears to be an unreasonable boss is because you are lazy. And he's always on your case because you're lazy. It may be that you think you're working for an unreasonable boss because you are unsubmissive. You know the unsubmissive type, they roll the eyes when someone speaks to them. They roll the eyes. Well, maybe you're unsubmissive to the authority that God has placed over you. Maybe you think you're smarter than they are. Maybe you are smarter than they are, but they're still the boss. 
Maybe you're incompetent. Oh, how dare you ask me that? <laughs> Don't you know who I am? Maybe you're incompetent. What do I mean by that? I mean, maybe you don't really, maybe this job is not right for you. Maybe you've been promoted above your abilities. I could be the next president of the United States. What are you talking about? Well, maybe you're lazy. Maybe you're unsubmissive. Maybe you're incompetent. You need to, you need to get somebody to help you to figure that out. And, and once you've done an honest self-appraisal and you find that these things are not the cause of the bosses being unreasonable with you, then you move on. You move on. So secondly, you need to, by faith, at this point, you need to, by faith, welcome the opportunity that God is giving you to grow in the grace and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll take you over to James chapter 1. James 1. Now, the trials that James is going to talk about here are the trials that, that in one sense, were unique to that generation, coming to them in terms of persecution, but by application, we can take it into the workplace. So, James writes to them, he says, verse 2, chapter 1, "'Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let the endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him.'" Notice he doesn't say that it is all joy. He says you are to count it all joy. That is, a, that is a faith statement. You are, by grace, through faith, to thank God for the difficult circumstance that you find yourself in working for the unreasonable boss. Because you, you know that in this situation in which God has you, there, are, there is Christian growth available to you. And if you will pursue it, God will give it. It's an opportunity to grow. An opportunity to grow. Now, what if it's unbearable? What if it's unbearable? Well, it's an interesting question. What if it's unbearable? And unbearable means different things to different people. There's no universal standard of what's bearable and what's unbearable, right? Just like there's no universal pain standard. Right? You go to the hospital and they give you all those goofy little faces. And they tell you, okay, so are you this face or this face? You are you know, a two or three or an eight or a nine, and it's not the same for everybody. So what's bearable and unbearable is not the same. So for this, I, I, my mind goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21. I'll, don't turn there, I'll just read it to you. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21, Paul writes this interesting statement. He says, were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. Rather do that. I, I uh, apply this and say, you know what? If you can change jobs, do it. If you can change jobs, do it. If you can change careers, do it. If you find yourself working for someone who is making your life so incredibly difficult and you have prayed and you have examined your own heart and you realize that you're not at fault in this and you, and you have prayed for God's grace and you've, you've hung in there and, and you can see people have even confirmed to you, man, I see the incredible patience that you're learning as you're growing in this and you think to yourself, I've reached the end, I can't go any further, then you know what? Look for another job. It's okay. You don't sin. Look for another job. There's one more thing that sort of plays into this. It takes me over to 1 Peter. Helps us see the good in these tough situations. There is good in these tough situations. God, God you know, is at work. Isn't that great? Isn't it, isn't it really great that God is at work in every aspect of your life? So I go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. I pick it up in verse 18. 
I think this is, this is just really helpful instruction on how to respond in these, these situations. Peter says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Why? Because this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up unto sorrows when suffering unjustly, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But... If when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called to this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. And and while being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but He kept entrusting Himself to him who judges righteously. Isn't that amazing? Jesus, in the midst of suffering unjustly, continued to entrust himself to God the Father. And we have been called to follow his example. If you are not presently working for a a difficult boss, it will probably come to you. Such is the lot of humanity. And when you find yourself in that situation, how you approach it, your attitude towards it, how your Christian faith dovetails in will make all the difference in the world. Not just to be able to endure, but but the how you endure through it and the testimony that you give for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a new stamina for our work. Just one other thought I'll, I'm going to bring in here and we'll close it down. We have a new stamina for our work because it helps us long for the kingdom. That's sort of my last thought I wanted to bring together here. Okay? It helps us long for the kingdom. Listen, if, if, if your work were, were to be able to fulfill everything that, that God had created it to fulfill, then you would, you would have heaven here on earth, Right? And if that were true, then then you wouldn't long for the kingdom of God at all. But we are to long for the kingdom of God. We are to recognize that that this life is not all there is, right? We are aliens, we are strangers, we are sojourners passing through. There is much more to come. So it's a fool's errand to, to seek to squeeze out of this life that which can only be gathered in the next. So keep an eye on heaven while you work. I think of it this way. Paul says in Romans 8, verses 19 and following, he says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. All of creation groans with you, waiting for the return of Jesus Christ when He will set up His millennial kingdom. And and we will begin to be able to to enjoy in, in actuality that which we only have in potentiality and little snippets day to day. Long for the kingdom. Pray for the kingdom. Maranatha, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Beloved, may these things sustain your soul on your way to work tomorrow. God bless. Father, thank you for thank you for your word and, and thank you that it is so very practical. It is not merely just a religious word as if somehow there's a spiritual part of our life and then there's everything else and and that you're only concerned with the spiritual part. Father, you have created us body and soul, material and immaterial. And you are every bit as concerned for our bodies as you are for our souls. And so the Word of God has a lot to say about both. This morning we, we've just looked at things and we've looked at them quickly and we've looked at them only in a cursory fashion and there's so much more that could be, could be said and, and 
Many, many implications drawn out from the things that are there. But Father, I pray that you would use your word this morning and that which is true and, and correct and accurate and you would just cause it to reside in our hearts and to, to ruminate there and to begin to, to produce fruit. Father, those things that were said today that were not true to the word or, or unhelpful, Father, may your spirit just cause them to vanish. Just take them away from our minds. May you work in us, O oh Lord. We desire to, to, to experience the fullness of what it means to be united with Christ. For it's in his name we pray, amen. God bless you, beloved.